Hey, thanks for joining us today for our study in the book of Esther. We're going to be on lesson four, but we're in chapter two. We're going to take verses 12 through 23 and finish out the chapter. This is one of my favorite parts of the chapter because what it does, it, it tells us all the details that the women had to go through that were in the king's harem. And so we'll be reading about that. I'll make some comments. We talked about in our last study that the king at the snap of his fingers could have a woman in his bedchamber every night. And we also know that he spent a lot of time with the various women in his harem. He had one queen, but he had many, 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 many concubines. As a matter of fact, we're told according to history that, that uh, Artaxerxes I had 115 sons and I don't know how many daughters, but so we know he spent a lot of time with the women that were in his harem. So they would do as much as they could, spend as much time to get these women as beautiful as possible. And that's not a bad thing. That, that's a good thing. They had certain ways that the women would decam decontaminate themselves, and this would take many, many months as far as a process. They would saturate their hair, the pores of their skin, with fumes from a cosmetic burner. They would have pedicures, manicures, plucking of eyebrows, and they would also paint their hands, their feet, their legs, their, their, their neck, their back with henna. Henna is a plant, and it's a plant that can be used for purposes like tattooing, and that's what this was all about. They weren't just painting themselves to change the color of their skin. They were painting pictures and designs and images on their skin. Henna can also be used to dye hair. For many years, a woman in, was in the church that I previously pastored, and she would use henna, the, the henna plant, to dye her hair, and it dyes your hair orange, and her hair was a bright orange. And so when it started fading out, she would re-dye her hair with the henna plant. And so they would dye their hair, they would dye different parts of their skin. And so the women in the king's harem, uh, they would do everything they could do, uh, even their toenails, their fingernails, to make themselves look pretty or desirable for the king. Now, I want you to think about this with these women. They had no job, no responsibility, no cooking, no washing clothes, no cooking dinner, no cleaning up after dinner, no cleaning the house. Someone else did all that. They spent all of their time getting beautified and making themselves beautiful. So the clothes they wore, I mean, these women were pampered to no end, and uh, they indulged in every way possible in the harem of the great king Xerxes. So let's read a little bit about this. This is in Esther chapter 2 and verse 12. Before a young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to her to take care of her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go there and in the morning return to another part of the harem to the care of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. So, yeah, you're getting it. The king spent time with these women. He spent nights with these various women to decide which girl he wanted to be his queen. And then after he had decided on his queen, then he would still spend time and nights with his concubines. Verse 15. When the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his un uncle, Abihel, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what he guy, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. So God gave her favor with everyone that she came in contact with. I mean, this was totally a God thing. We read in verse 16, she was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the 10th month, 
the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So according to history, what we read is, is that Esther became queen in the winter of 479 to 478 BC, four years after the removal of Vashti. So Esther must have been as beautiful on the inside as she was on the outside. Josephus, who I think I've mentioned in this study, a first century historian, said that Esther must have been the most beautiful woman in all of the Persian world. Well, let's go back and read, and we'll read in verse 18. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. Verse 19. This is interesting. Pay attention. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. So evidently there was a reassembling of these, these women, as they were calling them virgins, like a special procession that was des designed to show the beauty off of, of Esther in comparison to all of the other women who were part of this Miss Persian uh, pageant. Verse 20, but Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality just as Mordecai had told her to do. For she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. Again, I'll mention that she was very submissive and loving to Mordecai and respectful for who he was, which was quite remarkable and admirable and praiseworthy because she was now queen. So Mordecai, here he is sitting there in the gate, in the entrance of the king's gate, he had some type of a position there. We're not sure what it was. But here he, he, he is there to, to watch over things, to watch people who come in. And we see his loyalty displayed as he uncovers a conspiracy. Mordecai was apparently really, really important. And uh, this, this is cool how this takes place. Because God put him in this position not only to, to save a king's life and his love of his life, Esther, but to save his entire people. And so let's just take a look at this in verse 21. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers, who guarded the doorway, became angry and, and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot, and he told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated to be found true, the two officials were impelled on poles. And this was recorded in the book of the uh, Annals of the Presence of the King. So please understand this. The men were actually hanged, and impalement was not the method of execution, but it was rather a procedure they would use to disgrace a person and dis disgrace their life by showing them publicly impaled on a pole after they are already dead. The practice had, I mean, it had a long history in, in the Persian world and in, in the Near East world. As a matter of fact, King Darius, uh, Xerxes' father, which we read about in the book of Daniel, was once known to have impelled 3,000 men. That's a lot of men. And it says all this was recorded in the book of the annals of the, pres of the presence of the king. So King Ahasuerus was very careful to record the name, the father, the town of anyone who demonstrated particular loyalty to him or to his throne, to his kingdom. And usually he would record, uh, reward them rather quickly and generously. But did he remember that loyalty to Mordecai? Or perhaps was he a little bit late? And if he was a little bit late, was that by God's design? 
for him to be a little bit late in rewarding Mordecai. I think you'll see what I mean a little bit later when we get into a little deeper into this study. But God, I believe, was providentially, not coincidentally, putting things together to deliver his people from extinction. So again, God's timing is perfect. And we're going to be looking in chapter 3 of Esther, Haman's conspiracy, and how things worked out for everyone in this story. So join us, please. <music>